Proclaim Media's Polity, Amlum Gilen Gompe. Joining me today is author and historian Richard Stein, here to discuss his latest book, Rhodes and His Banker, Empire, Wealth and the Coming of Union. Your book tells the story of the remarkable friendship between Cecil John Rhodes, a larger-than-life historical figure, and Sir Lewis Mitchell. What sort of relationship did they have, and can you discuss the extent of their roles in developing the commercial fortunes of De Beers and Standard Bank? Well, that's quite a question. Uh, will require quite a long answer. Let me just say that this book has three themes to it. The one is the history of the Standard Bank in its earliest days. The second one is the life story of its probably most famous manager, Sir Louis Michel. And then the third element of the book is Rhodes and the relationship between Michel and Rhodes, which began in acrimony. They were on opposite sides. Rhodes was trying to amalgamate all the diamond interests in Kimberley and was ramping up the share price of the diamond companies. And Michel, in his capacity as head of the Standard Bank, was trying to dampen down what he saw as a speculative bubble developing. So the two sort of eyed each other. And then they at last had the first meeting in about, I think it was 1888. But the meeting which began in acrimony uh, ended up in amity. Both men got on well. Rhodes realized that Michel was not a businessman to be trifled with. He could persuade a lot of banks to do his bidding, but he wasn't going to persuade the Standard Bank. And Michel, I think, was taken by Rhodes's um, charm, because he was known to be charming when he wanted to get his own way. And then the relationship developed uh, over time. Rhodes became Premier of the Western Cape. Michel was the leading banker in the Cape Colony in Cape Town. And then Rhodes went north into what became Rhodesia and Michelle allowed the Standard Bank to be set up in Rhodesia, in Salisbury, and then in Bulawayo. So their paths crossed initially, then they became friends and admirers of one another. And quite astonishingly, uh, Rhodes managed to persuade Michelle to resign from Standard Bank if and when Rhodes died. Uh, and Michelle duly did that when Rhodes, who was always, as you know, in bad health, died at the age of 48 in uh, 1902. Michelle resigned from the bank, but devoted the rest of his life to promoting, to helping to run Rhodes's vast estates helping to launch the Rhodes Scholarship Program. And also, I should add, he was the first biographer of Rhodes after Rhodes' death. Uh, his biography came out, I think it was 1907. So Michel really devoted the rest of his days to the memory of Rhodes and trying to advance Rhodes' uh, imperialist vision of, in the first place, uniting the Dutch, as he called them, and the English in South Africa. The Standard Bank can place its origins to the flourishing war industry of the 1860s in Port Elizabeth. Yeah. As a person who had considerable responsibilities within the bank, what were Mitchell's initial impressions of diamond and gold mining? Well, look, there were three great personalities in the Standard Bank of the 19th uh, century. The first was the founder, John Patterson, a Scot who actually founded the bank. The second was the first manager sent out after the bank was launched in England, uh, Robert Stewart. And it was he who took the Standard Bank up into the diamond fields when other banks wouldn't uh, wouldn't risk buying diamonds at that stage. And Michel Stewart went back to England. Michel took over, and he was also instrumental in the bank opening uh, or developing in in Kimberley, and then also going into the Transvaal when gold was discovered. So the bank was first on the diamond fields, first on the gold fields, and it was thanks to the a willingness to take risks and the enterprise of Stuart and then Michelle that made the bank the leading bank in the country at that time. What sort of strategies did Mitchell have to enact to 
keep Standard Bank away from political controversy and also in financing the development of the gold fields in the Afrikaner-dominated Transvaal. Michel, uh, first of all, his it's interesting. He claimed in those days most bank uh, depositors were white. They were either Dutch or the Afrikaners or English speaking. And Michel was very keen to emphasize that the bank served all customers and all races, and there was no discrimination between uh, language groups. So he did a lot to bring uh, Afrikaners together. And the, and because the Standard Bank was so strong in the Cape, he was welcomed initially in, into the Transvaal. And he, again, uh, the, the the bank financed a lot of the gold mining development in the Transvaal. But of course, most of the capital came from overseas. But what the bank had, it certainly assisted in the in the development of the gold mining industry, yes, and made good money from it. Can you discuss the significance of Kimberley and Oxford University in Rhodes' life? How did he go about managing his commercial pursuits with his long cherished dream of obtaining a law degree? Well, he <laughs> that's a good question. It took him eight years to get a degree at Oxford. The first time he went, he wasn't there at term, uh, and he got a chill while uh, rowing on the River Isis and had to come back and, and, and recuperate in Kimberley. His doctor gave him six months to live. He came back and got involved again in, in developing his... Had a water, he and Rudd had a, a, a water pumping business uh, on the mines, but all the while, whatever money they made, they were buying up shares in mining companies. And uh, Rhodes made a little bit of money, which enabled him enough money to go back to uh, to Oxford on, I think it was 1873, twice at the time he went to Oxford uh, and came back to uh, Kimberley for the long vacation. But it was only in, I think, 1881, Eight years after he first stopped, went to Oxford, that he managed to had enough time to go back and get his BA degree because by that stage he was a really a leading force on the diamond fields and could uh, could afford the time to be away. Can you discuss the powerful network of business relationships that Rhodes had developed to consolidate and amalgamate his gold and diamond mining interests? Look, there were other big uh, diamond magnets uh, around at that time, but Rhodes quietly just bought up shares in their company, particularly Barney Bonato's company. But Bonato was a prominent Jewish uh, financier, man about town, man of many parts, street fighter, uh, exhibitionist, circus performer, and so on, but also very successful in the diamond field. And he and Rhodes... There were French investors, there were investors in London, but Rhodes gradually, 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 and with the help of Lord Rothschild in England, and also with the help of the financier Alfred Byte, managed to outwit all the competition and eventually was able to launch the De Beers Consolidated Mines uh, Limited in the late 80s. Where did Rhodes' belief in the supremacy of the Anglo-Saxon race and his ideas for imperial expansion originate from? And how significant was this worldview in shaping the trajectory of his dual careers as a business person and as a politician? Well, it was instrumental in his belief. You know, Rhodes always claimed, and I think there's some truth in this, that he wanted to make a lot of money to advance the cause of the Anglo-Saxon race around to advance the cause of the British Empire because he believed that the world would be a better place if they had more Englishmen in it, um, which is a dubious proposition, but one that he firmly believed in. At that time, Britannia ruled the world. You know, the, 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 common, the, the empire was at its height, and uh, Rhodes's ideal was to make enough money to advance British interests in Africa but he didn't want money for the sake of money. He didn't live a high life. He didn't buy yachts. and He wanted money for the political power it could bring him. And throughout his life, he needed more money to give him more political power to advance what he believed. The, he believed his role in life was to advance the interests of the British people. 
Anglo-Saxon race. That that was his core, and but he needed a lot of money to do that, uh, and he made a lot of money, as you know. And finally, what role did Mitchell play in shaping the legacy of Rhodes? He had to run the De Beers company and a couple and several other of and oversee several other of Rhodes's business interests, farming interests, particularly over the next few years. Help establish the railways in Rhodesia. But I think his most long-lasting contribution was helping to get the road scholarships off the ground in South Africa, initially in South Africa, and then it spread to other parts of the empire and to Germany for a spell and then to Australia. But Michelle and Jamison and Lord Milner, who was then, uh, after the Boer War, was the governor of the Transvaal, effectively, got the road scholarships off the ground. And I think that was his major contribution to extending Rhodes' legacy because the road scholarships are still in operation today, as you know. That was Richard Stein discussing his book, Rhodes and His Banker, Empire Wealth and the Coming of Union.